Hello, this is Maureen Hansen. I want to give you an update from the Cornell NIH MECFS Center. I'd like to draw your attention to our website for the Center for Innervating Neuroimmune Disease. This center encompasses the NIH MECFS Center grant and uh, the news tab on this website is particularly useful has a lot of previous presentations by myself and lab members, and also some links to some publications. Our center encompasses Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, and our medical school, which is Weill Cornell Medical College, which is located in Manhattan, New York. We have components of the center that are at Ithaca College and at the Boyce Thompson Institute, and we are involved with several uh, different medical and health professional practices. Before starting on my update, I wanted to remind people of some previous work we did, which was on the gut microbiome. We published two papers uh, in 2016, and these papers attracted a lot of attention because a lot of the reporters made their stories into, oh, chronic fatigue syndrome isn't psychological, it's biological because gut microbes are disturbed. I think this was helpful for educating people that indeed MECFS is a biological illness. Subsequently, uh, this finding of uh, altered gut microbiome has been uh, reproduced uh, in other, other labs, uh, for example, at the NIH MECFS Center at Columbia. In our study, we examined the presence of LPS in plasma and uh, also looked for uh, the amounts of LPS interacting proteins in plasma. Now, LPS is on the surface of gram-negative bacteria, and if these bacteria escape into the blood, there will be extra LPS uh, in, in the blood and LPS interacting proteins. And both of these were higher in MECFS patients on average than controls, indicating a dysfunctional gut uh, barrier. We also found that there was uh, less bacterial diversity in the gut microbiome of people with MECFS versus uh, controls. And we saw a reduction in the type of bacteria that produce butyrate, which is an anti-inflammatory metabolite. Furthermore, we found that we could classify 83% of the samples as being either from patients or controls by combining the blood and gut assays in quantitative uh, measures. So while this shows that the gut microbiome is disturbed in MECFS, this is not specific to MECFS. Changes are also reported in other diseases, some of which are not very uncommon. Uh, Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, for example, uh, uh, inflammatory bowel disease and Parkinson's disease. Uh, all of these diseases also have a change in the gut microbiome. The goal of our Cornell Center is to identify the underlying cause of these MECFS symptoms, and they are many, and most patients have a large number of these symptoms. We'd like to know what the treasure chest is, where, where, to, where to find it, what is the underlying cause. That, we think, is, is what we really need to find out if we're going to understand how to improve the condition of people with MECFS. There are three types of abnormalities that are characteristic of MECFS that's been shown through a lot of different uh, previous studies. It's known there's nervous system dysfunction, there's inflammation and metabolic abnormalities. And these are all due to that underlying cause. We think that if we learn more about these uh, three components, we might be able to discover what that treasure chest is, where it's hiding. With regard to nervous system dysfunction, the project in our center that uh, is trying to study this area is led by Dacoma Shungu at Weill Cornell Medical School. He is performing brain scans to uh, look for neuroinflammation and magnetic resonance spectroscopy for oxidative stress. I can't report to you any results from this study because unfortunately, as a result of the pandemic, 
This study had to be put on hold for a year, a year before we could bring subjects back into the uh, hospital part of uh, Cornell Medical School in order to do these uh, scans. So the study has resumed and we hope to be finished with all of the patient visits uh, by the end of February. And then I'm sure Dr. Shungu will be examining the data and uh, writing it up for publication. We have been studying in my lab metabolic abnormalities that occur, occur in MECFS. We have published three papers shown here, which are freely available, but I'd like to tell you about a study that we're currently carrying out that is yet unpublished. We are soon going to submit this paper for publication. It's in the final stages of preparation. In this study, we looked at plasma metabolites of 105 subjects. We utilized the services of Metabolon, uh, a company that identified for us 933 metabolites. And they also told us about the existence of 224 metabolites that are characterized only by mass spectrometry uh, data. These are unidentified, but they will presumably become identified in the future as the met metabolomics field progresses. The cohort we used for analysis is shown below, and you can see that we used 60 MECFS patients, 45 controls. We eventually hope to get up to 90 uh, MECFS and 90 control subjects. The reason that we limited ourselves to 105 is that is how many we had in March 2020 when we temporarily had to stop recruitment. We didn't want to delay the study, so we went ahead with the samples that we already had. We found that the, most, the three most significantly different metabolites in abundance are lower in MECFS. These, unfortunately, are all three of them are unidentified metabolites. Nevertheless, they show that there really uh, are uh, significant differences between metabolites in patients versus controls. Nevertheless, there's considerable overlap between controls and MECFS in the abundance of those metabolites. So even though these are the three best as far as being different between MECFS and controls, they wouldn't be adequate to distinguish or diagnose a particular patient, whether they have MECFS or they're healthy. So we can't use this for diagnosis. We can only use it to get, gain some information about the nature of the differences between MECFS and controls. And this is true of all of the metabolites that we analyzed. We can't use them for diagnosis at this point, but we can use them to study uh, the underlying basis of MECFS. So what we uh, are doing is uh, to find out whether metabolites or other molecules change in response to exercise and after we induce post-exertional malaise. So the samples that we got those data points for you before are these samples that we collect when someone first shows up in the office. And then uh, each of our subjects carries out a maximal cardiopulmonary exercise test, and we collect blood afterwards. 24 hours later, they come back, and at that point, the MECFS patients are likely to be experiencing post-exertional malaise. The controls should be in much better shape. We collect blood again. We have another cardiopulmonary exercise test, and we collect blood a fourth time. So, this first blood collection, if we compare these two samples, we're looking at the immediate effect of exercise. If we compare these two samples, we're looking at the extent of recovery. How does the blood return to normal or not after uh, there's been a 24-hour recovery period? And then we can look at the immediate effect of exercise, but now we're looking in the patients at least after they have had post-exertional malaise induced. Now, we have a tremendous amount of data, and I can't describe it all, but I'll give you just a glimpse of it, and hopefully soon you'll be able to read about this in a publication. The number of significantly different metabolites increases in females during both exercise sessions and during recovery. This is shown here. You see a steady increase in females in the number of significantly different metabolites between controls and patients. This is in contrast to the males. Uh, 
we do have fewer males and so the, the data is not as robust but you can see that there's not much change in metabolites that are different bet between before and after the first exercise and before and after the second exercise but there is a jump between the uh, uh, second exercise uh, I mean the, the second blood sample and the uh, sample collected 24 hours later so there is a significant uh, different uh, metabolite uh, increase that occurs in males during that recovery period. So some of the pathways that are represented by these metabolites differ between the cohorts at all four time points. And so these pathways are really independent of the exercise stress. A number of these pathways have been observed before when people obtain just a single sample uh, of blood and analyzed it for metabolite differences. Exercise has an immediate differential effect on certain pathways. We can see changes between pre and post day one plasma and between pre and post day two plasma. But recovery occurs after 24 hours in these pathways to be similar to the baseline. The pathways are listed here. Uh, one that you may notice that has been studied previously by other labs is the citric acid cycle. And while we are seeing uh, differences, those differences go back to the baseline after the recovery period. Recovery after 24 hours does not occur in some pathways in females. Starting at post day one, the level of significance of the differences increases and remains high through post day two. And these are the three pathways that uh, we particularly noted as not recovering uh, in that 24 hour recovery period. So these pathways could be involved in post-exertional malaise that's induced by 24 hours after the first exercise. And we can conclude from the study is that MECFS subjects differ not only at baseline, but metabolism responds to exercise and recovery differently than controls. And this differential uh, metabolism is uh, either a cause or a symptom of that post-exertional malaise. I'd like now to talk about immune cell metabolism. Uh, it is uh, one of the components of inflammation on our three main topics. Immune cells use various types of energy sources to respond to activation signals. So say a, a virus gets into your bloodstream, the metabolism changes so the immune cells can respond by multiplying themselves and by altering their functions. And typically, glycolysis increases, fatty acids are mobilized to synthesize membranes to make more cells, and to make more proteins, amino acids are utilized. We previously published a study uh, in which we examined specifically two types of immune cells, CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells. And what we found was the CD8 T cells were the more abnormal of the two in MECFS. They had, when isolated from the circulation, reduced gly uh, glycolysis. And also after they were stimulated in vitro, their glycolysis was lower than uh, that of uh, controls. Uh, we also noticed that the membrane potential of mitochondria was lower in these CD8 T cells, indicating that they're less functional than the CD8 T cells in controls. Uh, as far as CD4 T cells, we saw that glycolysis was lower when the cells were isolated from circulation, but not after they were stimulated in vitro. We also observed that there were distinct cytokine associations with this T cell metabolism. Basically, we're just demonstrating in this uh, paper that immune cells are dysfunctional in ways known to occur during chronic immune activation. For example, there could be a chronic viral infection, uh, a chronic uh, disturbance of homeostasis of the immune system, or perhaps autoimmunity. The current study is being led in my lab by graduate student Jessica Maya. She's looking at fatty acid oxidation by immune cells. Fatty acid oxidation is another way that immune cells gain energy. She presented this work at the 2021 IACFSME meeting. 
she prepared this nice slide that shows how she did the experiments. She uh, uh, took blood that had been collected and then isolated three types of cells using magnetic beads, CD4 T cells, CD8 T cells, and NK cells. And she examined them directly out of circulation and after stimulating them uh, to respond uh, in vitro. And then she did these measures using flow cytometry. Uh, she used confocal microscopy and she's been using the seahorse device that can record live cell metabolic rates. In general, her conclusions are that indeed also fatty acid oxidation is disturbed in cells uh, isolated from ME-CFS patients, further indicating immune dysfunction in these uh, ME-CFS uh, uh, isolated uh, lymphocytes. I'd like now to turn to some studies on extracellular vesicles in the plasma proteome. We published a pilot study on extracellular vesicles previously. We also previously published a study on the plasma proteome indicating that the efferin pathway is particularly disturbed and it's involved in axon guidance, angiogenesis, epithelial cell migration, and immune response. This is only a pilot study with 20 patients and 20 controls. And so uh, we now are doing a new study of plasma proteins with a larger cohort. That same large cohort we used for the metabolite study, uh, given that this earlier pilot study was promising. We found that the networks of cytokines in plasma differ between MECFS and controls and change following exercise and 24 hours later. Uh, this diagram to the right shows uh, the positive correlations between different cytokines uh, in controls. Uh, everything um, that's connect, er, each one of those dots is a different cytokine. And if there's a gray line connecting them, it means they're positively correlated. If there is a dark line connecting them, it means that the cytokines are negatively correlated. And you can see just by looking at this uh, as a broad overview that there's definitely some differences between uh, the negative correlations in the patients uh, versus the controls, but there's also some differences in the positive correlations. This can be seen here. Uh, at pre-day one, there's more positive correlations uh, in the MECFS uh, samples. Uh, there are fewer after the exercise, and then back after recovery, there's again more positive correlations in the MECFS than in the controls. This basically means that the the signaling networks in MECFS are disrupted. There's clearly, again, immune dysfunction. This work has been done by Ludovic Gilito, postdoctoral associate in my lab. Now, cytokines and other signaling proteins can also be packaged into extracellular vesicles, also known as EVs. Extracellular vesicles can be released from one cell type as the result of a stimulus and then they can be taken up by a second cell type and undergo, the second cell type can undergo a response. Extracellular vesicles contain proteins such as cytokines, but also other signaling proteins. They contain microRNAs, and these microRNAs can affect gene expression in the recipient cell. And messenger RNA is also packaged and can also affect the expression of proteins in the recipient cell. Uh, Ludovic Gilito found that the cytokine-cytokine correlations also differ in extracellular vesicles between cases and controls. Now, these diagrams are a little less complex because extracellular vesicles contain fewer detectable cytokines than plasma does, but nevertheless, you can see that they're just by a general uh, eyeballing of these uh, diagrams that there again is different, there are differences between the extracellular vesicles released by cells from MECFS patients versus controls. And there are changes that occur as a result of exercise and recovery. So far, we've detected 750 proteins in extracellular vesicles. 540 of these are in common. 103 were in controls only and 102 in MECFS only. But that is possibly because the 102 we detected in MECFS are higher in amount and so they're detectable. At a certain point, the machine that uh, does this analysis can't detect 
the proteins. So probably the 103 found in controls only are there are detectable because they're present in higher concentration than the MECFS and vice versa. The pathways that are represented by proteins uniquely found in EVs from either controls or MECFS subjects are shown here. And if you look at these, you can see that there's a lot in common. There are a lot of immune system characteristics uh, that uh, are, uh, of the proteins that are found. However, there are even some pathways that uh, are found in one or the other, not in the other, uh, in controls, not in MECFS, and vice versa. For example, muscle contraction in the controls, not seen in MECFS, and instead in MECFS, we see uh, evidence of cell disruption, program cell death and apoptosis uh, that we don't see in the controls. This was presented by Ludovic Sheila at the 2021 IACFSME meeting. The EV proteins that are significantly different change following the exercise stress. There are more significantly different after the exercise stress, uh, and then there is some recovery uh, 24 hours later. Now I'd like to talk about a project being done by one of the project leads in our center, Andrew Gimson, and his laboratory. He is studying gene expression in single immune cells from MECFS patients and controls. The reason that this is important is that comparing gene expression in total blood or total lymphocytes in the past has provided variable and sometimes uninterpretable data. There are probably over 40 studies of gene expression in MECFS uh, blood cells, many of them not similar to other studies. And I think one of the problems is trying to analyze a lot of different cells all at once together. So if you have one bad cell that is doing bad things in MECFS, for example, not carrying out its functions properly, the problem is when you as isolate RNAs from all of these cells, the RNA from this bad cell might be at a very low level in this collection of RNAs that's isolated as a bulk RNA amount. And you won't be able to tell that there is a bad cell not doing what it should be doing uh, while normal cell is doing what it's supposed to be doing in the controls because it's maybe these RNAs are at such a low level that you can't actually see when you analyze everything all together. So if we compare each individual type of blood cell with uh, between MECFS uh, patients and controls, then we can get greater resolution to identify differences to see if there is such an abnormal cell. We'll be able to see its RNA all by itself and compare it to the analogous cell type that is present in the control can look at the RNA in the controls, the RNA in the patient, and then see whether we can detect uh, differences at a higher level. So, so far, uh, uh, Andrew Grimson's lab has analyzed uh, samples from 30 MECFS cases and 30 controls. Uh, 4,500 uh, 4, cells have been analyzed in each sample. This sequencing is complete. It was used. It was done using a technology developed by 10x Genomics Company, and uh, uh, this is a data visualization method shown on the right, in which each one of these little dots is a different cell. is the is the constellation of transcripts in a different cell, and the closer two of these little dots are together, the more similar those patterns, those profiles of the RNAs are. And by looking at what RNAs are expressed and by knowing what, uh, what genes are expressed in different cell types, we can identify these uh, different uh, cells. So for example, we know these are B cells down here. We know this is uh, a CD8 T cell in this area. You know, we can find um, uh, other types of cells over here, CD4 monocytes, uh, CD14 monocytes over here. So we can look at these different cell types separately and compare them between patients and controls. And we're not just comparing them between patients and controls at a single time, but Andrew's lab is, is comparing the uh, single cells 
uh, gene expression before the first exercise and before the second one when the post-exertional malaise should be occurring in the cases. You might wonder why we're not doing all four and why we only did uh, 60 uh, uh, subjects. And the reason is that this technology is extremely expensive to perform. So we had to limit ourselves to 60 subjects and two time points. If we compare the uh, number of differentially expressed genes in the controls before day one and before day two, you see there's really not a whole lot of change in expression in these controls. These little yellow uh, dots here are uh, uh, indicating there's very little change. Each one of these columns is a different cell type as assayed in, in that kind, using that method I showed on the previous slide. So these are individual different types of cell types and they're really not very much different. But if instead you compare the controls with the cases, you can see at pre-day one, there are actually a number of different cell types that have a lot of differences between uh, the cases and controls gene expression. So these are interesting in themselves, but uh, also interesting is what happens between pre-day one and pre-day two. So if we look here, we see that Here's a cell type that has a lot of differences between cases and controls at uh, pre-day one, but 24 hours later, there's actually not very much difference. And that's a result of the exercise and recovery period. On the other hand, here's a case where there's differential expression even before any exercise, but after the exercise and recovery period, there is an increase in the differentially expressed uh, uh, genes. So this data is being analyzed by Andrew Grimson's lab and his collaborators, and he is beginning to write up a manuscript that we hope also will be available uh, not too far in the future. Uh, what's really exciting about this is using a machine learning approach and the single cell gene expression data, MECFS patients can be distinguished from controls at a very high precision. So this could uh, be quite valuable uh, and potentially even if in the future uh, participate uh, constitute part of a diagnostic uh, test. Our future plans are to complete this data acquisition. Uh, we still have more data to acquire and we have more subjects to do and we want to once we do this examine the different types of data together. If we put everything together we then hopefully will be able to get a hint as to what that underlying cause is uh, and we'll certainly know a lot more about these uh, three components of the disruption in MECFS. Before we end, I wanted to discuss this question and that is what has the existence of long COVID done for MECFS? One thing I think it's done is demonstrated that almost all MECFS could be post-infectious. We have a recent article uh, in which we review the information that suggests that enteroviruses might be the virus that's behind the outbreaks of MECFS and perhaps the spontaneous cases as well. The fact is, is that many of the people who have long COVID had asymptomatic cases and yet they developed long COVID, which has a lot of symptom, symptom overlap with, uh, with MECFS. So while many people with MECFS cannot figure out what the inciting factor was, it's certainly possible they had a viral infection that was asymptomatic. And while they might ascribe their uh, uh, coming down with MECFS due to some stress, psychological or physical, it could actually have been a asymptomatic viral infection. I think it's also made some doubters, at least some of them, realize that post-viral syndromes are real and that they are serious biological illnesses, especially those doubters who themselves are health professionals who now understand from getting long COVID themselves that this is a serious problem. 
But one thing I would like to caution, and that is the conclusion that common symptoms mean the same underlying mechanism. Does long COVID really the same thing as ME-CFS? Many years of study with more luxurious funding of Gulf War illness has shown that ME-CFS and Gulf War illness are not the same at the molecular level, despite considerable overlap in symptoms between Gulf War illness and ME-CFS. If I had to lay a bet, I will bet that long COVID and ME-CFS will turn out not to be the same because there are already not only overlapping symptoms, but some different symptoms that uh, people experience in long COVID that people with ME-CFS don't normally experience. So I think it's very premature to say, oh, we don't need to study ME-CFS pre-2020 anymore because we'll just be able to study long COVID and that will tell us how to treat ME-CFS and it will tell us the underlying cause of ME-CFS. That has not been the case for Gulf War illness. We don't have treatments resulting from years of study of Gulf War illness. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't compare long COVID and pre-2020 ME-CFS because it could reveal underlying causes that are common to both illnesses. There could be some common mechanisms. And even though these are different, it's still worth comparing the two. But I don't think it's appropriate to abandon the study of ME-CFS. I'd like to end with my acknowledgments. I'm showing my lab members who participated in these studies, uh, the Andrew Grimson's lab members whose unpublished data I showed. And we have a number of collaborators in our uh, NIH MECFS Center. We have funding from NIH, the Sloan Foundation, Cimarron Research in Incline Village, Nevada, as well as from some private donors. I would also like to specially thank our volunteer human subjects who carried out these two-day exercise tests, even knowing they were going to be inducing post-exertional malaise. Thank you. Hello. I'd like to welcome you to today's discussion of Dr. Maureen Hansen's ME-CFS research team's findings. I'm Susan Taylor Brown, a member of the Community Advisory Committee, CAC, which is part of the NIH-funded ME-CFS Collaborative Research Centers. We will be discussing questions raised by the CAC regarding your research findings. As we, get, we begin, please take a moment to introduce yourselves. Uh, hello. I'm Maureen Hansen. I'm director of the Center for Innervating Neuroimmune Disease. And one, one part of our center is one of the NIH and ECFS centers. Uh, I'm a molecular biologist and geneticist by training. Jessica, do you want to go next? Sure. Hello, my name is Jessica Maya. I am a graduate student uh, interested in the metabolism occurring inside of the immune cells involved in MECFS. Uh, okay, so uh, Ludovic, how about you next? Uh, hello, um, I'm Ludovic Giloto. I'm a PhD trained in microbial ecology, and I started working on MECFS about eight years ago, looking at the microbiology, microbiome of uh, MECFS patients. Uh, we published a paper in 2016, actually. And, and since I moved from the micro scale to the nano scale, uh, looking at extracellular vesicles and their content, proteins and microRNA in collaboration with Dr. Grimson here. Okay, so the next person to introduce himself is Andrew Grimson, who is one of the principal investigators of our NIH MECFS Center. Hi, I'm Andrew Grimson. I'm an associate professor at Cornell in the same department as Maureen. Uh, we work on gene regulation and genomics. Uh, a lot of our projects are centered on the immune system and it's, it's those, that part of the lab that's really heavily involved in our MECFS research. Okay, well, thank you very much. What I'd like to do is begin with your earlier studies from 2016. You mentioned that you're using a combination of a lipopolysaccharide LPS test and a gut microbiome survey 
measuring biodiversity and but butyrate producing bacteria correctly identified 83% of the ME CFS cases. While this finding is not strong enough to become a diagnostic biomarker on its own, combining these tests with symptoms and or, or other indicators has the potential to aid in diagnostic and clinical care. What would it take to develop this approach to become a diagnostic biomarker? So one reason it was important to show that we could identify 83% of cases correctly by combining the microbiome data and the LPS data is that it was an important demonstration that MECFS is a real biological illness. At that time, the microbiome was getting increasing attention in the popular press. And a press release that uh, was produced on the study was picked up by a large number of national international websites with such titles as uh, chronic fatigue syndrome is not in your head, it's in your gut. Um, now, I don't actually think that the gut microbiome is the source of the illness, but instead I think it's likely that the gut dysbiosis is a symptom of the disease. Nevertheless, the publicity given to the disease as biological rather than psychological was important in 2016, where there were still some doubters. The analysis by uh, the, the analysis of the gut microbiome by sequencing and the analysis of the sequence data is currently quite expensive, and it would need a great deal of technology development before it would become a feasible routine test. The other problem is that humans vary a great deal in the microbiome uh, from one healthy or unhealthy person to another, and the microbiome can be affected by many factors. That's another challenge. What, what, what are the what are the pe people's diet might make a difference? And also people take supplements and probiotics. Some of the differences seen in MECFS, like the low butyrate producing species are also seen in other diseases. So it seems to me that it's more likely that a simpler diagnostic test, perhaps using blood or urine, is really more likely to eventually become available. Thank you, that's very interesting. Now I'd like to move on and focus on immune dysfunction. You noted that immune cells are dysfunctional in MECFS subjects, indicating three possible processes. First, chronic viral infection. Second, disturbed homeostasis of the immune system. And or finally, autoimmunity. What process do you see as being the most probable based on your research thus far? Well, it's actually possible that all three are true simultaneously. A, a chronic viral infection can be continuously stimulating the immune system and also leading to production of antibodies to self proteins. And maybe perhaps the least likely is a disturbed homeostasis of the immune system in the absence of a chronic infection or autoantibodies. But maybe some unknown damage is causing the continued disturbance. It's also possible that an autoantibody is keeping the immune system in an abnormal state in the absence of a chronic viral infection, even though a virus initiated the disease. We, we just simply don't have enough data to choose between these alternatives. Sounds like a good area to keep researching then. As we move forward, what stands out for you in finding that the immune system is dysfunctional? Well, there's a wealth of information that demonstrates abnormalities in various aspects of the immune system. It's been known since the 1990s, uh, not long after the many outbreaks that occurred in the mid 80s, that natural killer cells are abnormal. Signaling proteins such as cytokines are abnormal in their relative levels to one another. And two types of T cells exhibit abnormal me metabolism. That's some of Jessica's work actually. So single cell RNA sequencing done by Andrew Grimson's lab has revealed disturbed gene expression in various types of immune cells. We don't yet know what these abnormalities are telling us about the underlying cause of the disease. They are consistent with all three of the processes, chronic viral infection, a persistent dysregulated immune system or autoimmunity. Thank you. Can you further expand on the potential implications of a disturbance in fatty acid oxidation 
Could this be a link to post-exertional malaise or PEM? Well, that's work that's being done by Jessica Maya. And so I'd like her to take that question. Thank you. Sure. So basically when immune cells use alternative fuels like fatty acids, it tells us something about the functions of these cells. For example, as Maureen mentioned, natural killer cells are known to have lower cytotoxicity in MECFS. But the cause of this, which is unknown, could be because of this increased lipid accumulation that's actually interfering with the cell's machinery, which is necessary for it to function. And this is suggested by my experimental results. As for T cells, we've previously seen that they have lower glycolysis, which is another important metabolic pathway. And now we know they also have this increased fatty acid oxidation. And this type of metabolic profile is pretty common in chronic viral infections, as well as chronically stimulated immune cells that simply don't function well. So by uncovering what fuels these important immune cells are using, we can begin to understand why or how they may not be functioning correctly. And these metabolic changes could be linked to post-exertional malaise, since irregular energy pathways in immune cells can contribute to immune dysfunction that's a result of stress, which could present itself as increased inflammation in cases of MECFS. Thank you so much, Jessica. We're gonna move on now to extracellular vesicles. Are the extracellular vesicles, EVSs, proteins that were found to be significantly different in cases versus controls, also found in diseases like POTS, fibromyalgia, or other diseases? So this question is a good one for Ludovic Gilato to answer since that's his research area. Thank you. Okay. Um, so regarding fibromyalgia or POTS, uh, I am not really aware of any study that looked at the proteins uh, inside those vesicles. I know that some studies did analyze the proteins inside uh, uh, the serum or plasma, and they found differences in, in patients and controls. So in POTS, for example, there was a very sex-specific signature um, where they found lower levels of myoglobin in the females with POTS, uh, myoglobin being a protein that is found in, um, in muscles and known to be increased when there is a muscle damage. <clears throat> As for fibromyalgia, also proteins were found to be upregulated and downregulated in patients with fibromyalgia, but again, they were looking at plasma. And some of those proteins were the same that we found to be different in MECFS, but in vesicles. So even though if I'm, uh, there are some similarities in this finding I just mentioned, I think it's kind of difficult to extrapolate or compare these results to our study because you have to keep in mind that we are focusing on a very specific compartment of the blood, those vesicles and their content. Basically proteins that are being encapsulated in vesicles that could travel throughout the body come from different origins. So I don't think this really reflects the proteins that can be found in plasma or serum. But yes, other diseases uh, have looked, they looked at uh, EV, uh, the EV content. Uh, and so for example, Alzheimer and Parkinson's disease, and they found vesicles uh, propagating pathogenic uh, proteins, facilitating the spread and exacerbation of the disease. Uh, for example, alpha synuclein, uh, in Alzheimer uh, was found in the vesicles and it's a protein known to perpetuate neuroinflammation and neurodegeneration resulting in brain dysfunction. We did find common EVs proteins being different in MECFS and those diseases and we found also other proteins in MECFS that were unique in MECFS but I think it's too early to give any conclusions uh, in their involvement in MECFS uh, symptoms and I wanted to make a last comment. So even if I just said that EVs can transfer pathogenic molecules involved in disease progression, they can also carry a cargo of therapeutic proteins, which could protect the specific cell types. They could also reduce oxidative stress and neuroinflammation, increase neurogenesis, improve cognitive functions. And usually those EVs are coming from stem cells. Thank you so much. Your data indicates the following, that following exercise, the extracellular vesicles, EVS, were much 
different in MECFS cases versus controls. What do you attribute this variation to, and what do you think the significance is of this variation? Okay, so um, firstly, we are comparing a disease state with verse, versus health. So we were initially expecting differences at baseline before subjects were doing any exercise. So we have shown increased number of EVs at baseline before exercise in MECFS. So we can hypothesize here that a greater number of those vesicles is present, already present, or being produced in response to the disease. Secondly, we did, uh, the subjects were challenged to an exercise. So we then looked again at the differences in the EV numbers and the proteins. What we found was one, an increased number of EVs, and two, an increase of significantly different proteins in the MECFS population, different from the controls. It is really well documented that exercise induces the release of vesicles. So here, no surprise, it's what we found in the increased number of vesicles. And as for the differences in between patients and controls, well, that could be again attributed to the fact that we are comparing a disease, disease subject with healthy subjects, and this is reflected in the EV protein content. And uh, I have to say that I'm not really aware of any studies in other diseases where they looked at the effect of a stress challenge on the protein content of EVs, which makes our study kind of unique. So again, are these EVs pathological, beneficial? Are, they, are these EVs secreted, recruited, and do they travel to sites in, of inflammation during and after exercise? either exacerbating the symptoms or protecting cells from damages caused by the exercise. We don't really know at, the, at this moment, but I think these observation and variation are really significant. And I'm pretty sure that further analysis will help uh, better understanding the sim symptomatology exacerbation and maybe explain post-exertional malaise in MECFS. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. We're gonna shift now to the gene expression. Can you expand upon the possible implications of your findings on the differences in gene expression of the 4,500 cells that were analyzed? Well, these cells were analyzed in Andrew Grimson's lab. And so he should be answering this question. Okay, thanks, Maureen. Uh, so the, the primary goal of, of my lab study here was, first of all, to find the specific types of immune cells that are dysregulated in MECFS. And we're using their gene expression patterns at single cell resolution as the readout uh, to achieve that goal. And then the second goal is to look at the sets of genes that are altered. And by doing this, we can focus our later and now current studies on the specific components of the immune system that, that are most implicated in the disease. So at this point, we've now got a much clearer idea of which specific cell subtypes are altered in MECFS and which are not, and we think both are important. And as Maureen mentioned, at present, we're working on understanding what we can learn from the identities of the genes that are dysregulated. Thank you so much. Your talk indicates that gene expression in particular cells is different between cases and controls when measured before the subject's exercise. Can you comment about the effect of exercise on the genes that are expressed? Sure. So I think, first of all, I'll just say that many of the genes whose expression are altered in MECFS, they show the same or at least similar changes between patients and controls before and after exercise. However, as you, as you alluded to, there's a smaller number of genes that only show a difference between the patients and controls after exercise. And these are genes whose dysregulation could relate to post-exertional malaise. The way we do this analysis also gives us sort of an important technical advantage. We're looking at changes before and after exercise per individual. And by doing this, in effect, we're minimizing normal human inter-individual variation, allowing us to really focus down on dysregulation and gene expression that is linked to, to MECFS. Okay, thank you. What are the barriers to using single cell sequencing as a diagnostic biomarker? 
Um, the, major, the major barrier would be cost. It's an extremely expensive assay. However, I will say that, that from the data we already have, we think we'll be able to, to identify a small number of genes that could be looked at with more conventional and approachable technologies that could in the long run be useful um, as, a, as a biomarker. All right. Thank you. Now we're going to shift into more general questions as we start to wind down today's discussion. You state that there's been that what has been seen in Gulf War illness is not the same as an ME and that ME and long COVID may not be the same on a molecular or a mechanistic level. Can you elaborate that for us, please? So we're now hearing that a high percentage of people who get COVID-19 don't have their symptoms resolved within a few weeks and that even asymptomatic cases can result in long COVID. Uh, some are claiming after six months, these individuals now have MECFS. Since six months of fatigue, for example, is required for the diagnosis of MECFS. That's the reason that people are saying this is because the case definition for MECFS is based on symptoms, because unfortunately there's no diagnostic test for what I would call pre-2020 MECFS. If everyone who fits the IOM criteria for MECFS is now said to have MECFS, then not only long COVID, but most people who've been diagnosed with Gulf War illness could also be called MECFS patients. Yet many years of research on Gulf War illness indicate that at the physiological, the biochemical, and the molecular level, it's different than MECFS. Much of the important GWI research has been done by Nancy Klimas and Jim Baranek's group. And while I don't want to put words in their mouth, I would wager that they would tell you that Gulf War illness is not MECFS. If that's the case, then how can people conclude that long COVID is MECFS? No one who got MECFS founding, uh, following a, a viral infection before 2020 got it from SARS-CoV-2. There are indeed a number of overlapping symptoms between long COVID and MECFS, and many such patients do fulfill the IOM criteria, as well as other MECFS diagnostic criteria, all of which are based on symptoms. But it's extremely premature to conclude that the underlying causes of both diseases are the same. We need to continue to do research on MECFS since we can't assume that treatments for long COVID that result from the extremely generous support given for research on long COVID will result in any treatments for MECFS. For example, what if it does turn out that SARS-CoV-2 persists in some people causing most of the long COVID symptoms? Antivirals against SARS-CoV-2 or maybe tailored vaccines could help such individuals, but they certainly won't help pre-2020 MECFS patients since they didn't get MECFS from SARS-CoV-2. Thank you, that's a very fascinating point. I get the impression that you're leaning towards the idea that the prime mover for MECFS is immunological. Each body system affects every other and the interactions are complicated. Could you choose one or two aspects of disease presentation that people might not think of as immunological that could be explained by alterations in immune function? I would say that virtually every symptom of MECFS can be ascribed to an immunological problem given that autoantibodies can work in mysterious ways. Symptoms like uh, fatigue and headaches and malaise, muscle aches, um, those are most, more obviously immunological since they're common symptoms of any acute infection as the immune system is battling an invader. Many of us have had those symptoms when we got the flu, for example, but even unrefreshing sleep and orthostatic intolerance could be mediated by an autoantibody preventing the nervous system from working properly or perhaps a chronic viral infection in a nerve or brain region is preventing them from carrying out their functions normally. Thank you so much. Now, finally, given your findings thus far, would you mind telling us a little bit about your future plans for MECFS, MECFS research in your lab? 
What are the most promising areas of inquiry that you intend to pursue? Well, whether we or our collaborators work on them or other groups take them up, I think there are several areas that need to be investigated. One is whether there's actually a chronic viral infection in a reservoir in the body that's relatively inaccessible. John Chia's investigation of enteroviral sequences and stomach biopsies really should be repeated, given the evidence that we reviewed recently about the role of enteroviruses in MECFS outbreaks. Also, the autoantibody hypothesis needs to be investigated further. Uh, an example is that knowing the identity of autoantibodies that are present in multiple sclerosis resulted in animal models and treatments, even without knowing what caused those antibodies to exist. I think it's important for us to continue our work on immune cell gene expression and metabolism. There are many drugs that have been developed to modulate the immune system and other diseases. Even in the absence of knowledge of the underlying cause of the disease, if we knew more about the dysregulation that exists in immune function, maybe an existing drug could help, or with new knowledge, one could be developed. And then finally, I would say that we continue to be excited about the potential of extracellular vesicles to reveal what's happening in a variety of tissues in the body since they are released from many different tissues. Characterization of the cargo of these vesicles that we isolate from different body fluids or cell types might also allow us to identify diagnostic markers for MECFS. Wow, as we draw today's session to a close, I want to thank you all on behalf of the CAC for explaining this fascinating research findings and express our gratitude for your dedication to unraveling this complex chronic multi-system disease that has caused so many of us around the world to be missing from our lives. As you noted at the beginning, Maureen, in 2016, the model saying it was psychological was very prominent. Many of us on the CAC are still very involved in helping provide and disseminate your research findings to to promote the pathophysiological explanation. So we find this work is incredibly hopeful for all of us who are dealing with this illness. And I wanna personally thank you all. Thank you too. Thank you. Thanks.